Starting Overdrive. Real stories of starting over with Red Seton. Hey everyone, welcome to Starting Overdrive, where you'll hear real stories of starting over from real people of all walks of life. I'm your host, Reg Seaton. Welcome to part seven of the Starting Overdrive Turning Point series called Finding Your True Purpose. In this new segment of the podcast called Turning Points, I focus on significant life-changing events directly connected to the process of starting over. Events or turning points that alter who we are, force us to change direction in life, and let go of everything we once knew. This segment is an exploration into life-defining, irreversible turning points that rock us to the very core of our being and force us to accept change whether we like it or not. It's through these irreversible turning points that we truly learn who we are on the deepest level, what we can handle in life, the true power of the human spirit, and who we were meant to become. On many levels, who we thought we were before these major life-changing events was only preparing us for who we're supposed to be after the turning point. The following story is an extension of the most important, irreversible turning point that changed my life forever. This episode is a continuation from Part 6, called Lost and Found in a New Home, in which I told the story of being lost in my new home of Vancouver, British Columbia, after moving across the country by train in 1993 in order to start over. In the previous episode, I also discussed the process of finding my true identity, unlearning negative thought patterns, creating my own system for change, and how I began to build a new life for myself after being hit by a car on the East Coast, waking up from a coma, five years of recovery, numerous life-saving surgeries, having my life put on hold, and reaching a dead-end crossroads where I felt hopeless about my future. I also talked about making the pivotal decision in 1994 to leave my first job in Vancouver, which was deeply tied to my former identity and life on the East Coast. As long as I remained in that job, I could never truly be myself. So, a year after arriving in my new home, my new city, I found myself starting over again when I landed a new job at a coffee shop in downtown Vancouver. That job not only allowed me to feel better about myself as a person, but it also paved the way for the next major turning point in my life when I found what I consider to be my true purpose in life. The discovery of that purpose was the very beginning of a 20-year career in which I became an early pioneer in one of the most popular online industries. My professional world opened up in ways I could have never imagined taking me to Los Angeles, New York City, San Francisco, Hawaii, Hollywood, and beyond to world premiere red carpets and working with some of the biggest companies and names in the world. It was this true purpose in life that became the gateway to making my dreams come true. It sounds so cliche to say that, but it's true. There are so many people out there online today talking about making your dreams come true. I'm on the other side of that now. I've climbed that mountain and I know what it's like to make your dreams come true. There are days that I can't believe it happened, especially after what I went through personally, with getting hit by a car, waking up from a coma, enduring those five years of recovery, moving across the country into the unknown, starting over again, and being lost all over again in a new home. Just know that when you listen to this podcast, the totality of my story, all the chapters, both personally and professionally, it's all true. I'm not telling my story for any other reason than to help others in need. I've been there. I know what it feels like. In many ways, on a certain level of thinking, I've come to understand that the reason why I experienced and overcame so many extreme obstacles and trauma in my life was to provide hope to others. The reason why I'm telling my story in all these chapters and parts is because I've been to the depths of despair. I've felt hopeless about my life. I nearly lost my life several times. I endured years of extreme physical and mental trauma. I know what it's like to feel that everything is impossible. I've been there in those negative places, and I've never forgotten what they felt like, not for one second. When I say that the discovery of my true purpose in life was the gateway to making my dreams come true, just know that there was a time in my life when I thought nothing was possible and that my future was indeed hopeless. You know how positive things only happen to other people? There was a time in my life 
when I believed that I'd never make my dreams come true, because the challenges of my life seemed insurmountable. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to be lost without a purpose. I know what it feels like to lose your identity. I know what it feels like to be afraid to make change. I know what it feels like when no one believes in you. More importantly, though, I also know what it feels like to believe in yourself in ways that no one will ever understand. I'm telling this story to give you hope, to show you and anyone out there who may be struggling to find their purpose, that hope does exist within the most extreme circumstances and that you can make the seemingly impossible possible. You can find your purpose in life. You may not have all the answers. You may not know what that looks like. You may feel lost and that you'll never find your true purpose. It's okay. You don't need to have all the answers right now. You just need to remain open, have hope, and not give up. This is my story of not giving up. As a result, I found my true purpose in life. The year was 1994. 1994 was the same year U.S. President Bill Clinton delivered his first State of the Union address, calling for health care reform and a ban on assault weapons. The 1994 Winter Olympics began in February of that year in Lillehammer, Norway. Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List topped the box office that year and won seven Oscars at the Academy Awards, while Ace of Bases' The Sign and Boys to Men's I'll Make Love to You were two of the most popular songs of that year. 1994 was also the same year O.J. Simpson was charged and put on trial for the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. Also tragically, the world lost grunge pioneer Kurt Cobain in 1994, along with Formula One racing champion Ayrton Senna. Nelson Mandela was inaugurated as South Africa's first black president in 1994. Jeff Bezos founded Amazon in 1994. The Major League Baseball World Series was canceled for the first time in 1994 due to a work stoppage. And boxer George Foreman became the oldest heavyweight champion in history by beating Michael Moore to regain the heavyweight title 20 years after winning his first title. In Vancouver, my new home on the West Coast, 1994 was a profoundly significant year for the city's National Hockey League team, the Vancouver Canucks. Not only did the team unexpectedly get to the Stanley Cup playoffs in 1994, without much chance of going very far, the Canucks made a memorable Cinderella run all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals against the New York Rangers. Only a year before, in 1993, as I've mentioned numerous times, my life was at a dead end. I felt hopeless about my life and future after nearly losing my life several times. I yearned for change. I yearned for direction. I yearned for my purpose. I yearned for excitement. I yearned to take control of my life. One year later, in 1994, there I was on the West Coast, living in an emerging city with a professional hockey team, getting to experience what it was like for the team to make a Cinderella playoff run all the way to the Stanley Cup Finals. Growing up on the East Coast, I could only dream about what that was like, to live in a city with a National Hockey League team. After moving across the country to become a resident of Vancouver, I was now living that Stanley Cup dream along with the players themselves. In the previous episode, I talked about being lost during my first year of living on the West Coast. That period was so important and vital to eventually finding my true purpose. There was so much to work through internally at the time of my arrival on the West Coast. By the time I was 23, I had been through what seemed like a lifetime of dysfunction, change, pain, and trauma. Being lost was necessary for me to gain clarity and perspective on my life. When you don't have all the solutions to your problems in life, and you feel lost, overwhelmed, and struggling to find answers, the right answers, for example, struggling to find your true purpose or direction in life, sometimes the only thing you can do, sometimes the best thing you can do, is allow yourself to be lost, especially if you've been through a lot of pain, trauma, or extreme experiences. You need time to process those experiences. You need time to adjust. You need time to let go. Your soul needs time to breathe. That often manifests itself in feelings of being lost. The truth is, you're not lost. You're simply in the natural ebb and flow of life. You're where you're supposed to be. Without being lost, you can't be found, so to speak. They both go hand in hand, one before the other. In fact, when you're feeling lost and you keep moving forward, believing in yourself, you're actually one step closer to being found. I moved across the entire country of Canada, coast to coast by train, only to discover 
that life on the West Coast was drastically different than the East Coast where I grew up. I spent that first year letting go of so many elements of myself from the East Coast that didn't serve me on the West Coast. I was lost in the middle ground between who I was on the East Coast, who others thought I was, and who I truly was deep down inside. That first year, I had finally left my job at a gas station after using it to get my life up and running. No longer was I working for my father or getting a job solely because I knew someone on the East Coast. After being hit by a car, waking up from a coma, brain surgery, knee surgery, and so many more in my five years of recovery, having my life put on pause, I so desperately wanted to be my own man. I didn't want any handouts or sympathy. I wanted to prove that I could make it on my own. Like I mentioned before, I was bullied as a kid. That left me with deep feelings of being less than others. Until I got older, bigger, and began to make a lot of sports teams in my early teens. I went from unpopular kid to popular in the span of a couple years. Still, despite the attention of the popular crowd, those feelings of being less than others never went away. In my mid-teens, my parents' bitter public divorce and the end of my family unit, my security, left me with deep feelings of shame and inadequacy. No longer did I have the seemingly perfect family like everyone else, or so it appeared. Suddenly, because of my parents' divorce, I felt the eyes of others upon me, the eyes of judgment, as if I was no longer part of the club, or somehow second-rate. When I was bullied as an unpopular kid, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this, I yearned to be in the popular crowd. I wanted desperately to be accepted. When I finally became that popular kid through sports, I felt accepted. I felt equal. I no longer felt inadequate. The acceptance, however, was short-lived when my parents split so toxically in divorce. Suddenly, because of their relationship, I was no longer accepted. Or that's how it felt, anyway. I was forced to start over again, tainted by circumstances beyond my control. Then I was hit by a car not long after the end of my parents' relationship, virtually at the same time, which forced me into a completely different direction in life than anyone I had known. At the exact same time as I lost my family unit, the safety and security of all that I had known, my home, I also lost my identity and my direction in life. What I thought would be my true purpose in life, some type of career in sports or a sports-related field, was gone forever. It was gone in an instant when I was hit by a car. I knew it as soon as I opened my eyes after a week in a coma. As a result of my accident, my life was put on hold while all of my friends and peers moved forward in life. I was suddenly left behind to play catch-up. My goals weren't in the long term like everyone else. Career, family, the house, the two cars, kids, white picket fence lifestyle. I didn't have that luxury. My goals were literally focused on catching up to where others had already been. While others were beginning their careers, I was still trying to finish school, get into university, recover from my injuries and surgeries, and find a way to work, all while still trying to lead a normal life like everyone else was leading. Again, this time because of my accident, extreme circumstances beyond my control, and being left behind, personally, academically, and professionally, I felt inadequate, second-rate, and less than others, just like I did when I was a kid and young teen. Now I was a young man, a young adult just beginning his life, and I couldn't stand how life unfolded for me. All throughout my life, I knew I wasn't inadequate or less than anyone. I felt imprisoned by circumstances that were forced upon me. As a person, as a man, I couldn't settle for that as my fate, despite how lost I felt. When I moved to Vancouver in 1993, I had a lot to prove especially since my friends and colleagues had passed me by in school and career while I was left behind and forced to play catch-up. My first year in Vancouver, I had found a job, got an apartment, and was up and running in my own life, beyond the identity of who I was on the East Coast and who people perceived me to be back there. My second year, I had left the gas station world forever and began working at a Starbucks coffee shop in downtown Vancouver, only minutes away from where I lived. I felt on top of the world. I felt like I was finally stepping into the person I always knew I could become. The person I always knew I was, back east, beyond the circumstances that were defining me at the time. I was finally living and writing my own story into the future, rather than having life forced upon me back east. This was the mid-90s, and Starbucks wasn't quite the household name it is today. 
I remember the company's goal at the time was to have 2,000 stores by the year 2000. For anyone who drinks Starbucks coffee, I was actually working for the company before Frappuccinos were introduced. I was also working for the company when Frappuccinos were first introduced. It was an exciting time and a job that I didn't feel second-rate doing at the time. Working at the coffee shop changed my life. It was in the very heartbeat of downtown Vancouver when the city was emerging not only as a world-class destination, but also Hollywood North, where many well-known films and TV shows were filming. At work, it wasn't unusual to arrive for your shift and see a famous celebrity sitting in the store or outside on the patio having coffee. I met, chatted with, and made coffee for numerous celebrities I once only dreamed of meeting. Lauren Bacall, Adam Sandler, Rick Moranis, Gillian Anderson, David Duchovny, Adam Arkin, Carl Weathers, and so many more. At the time, that coffee shop was a place to be seen in Vancouver. On the job, most of the people who worked there were creative, with creative ambition, pursuing careers in the film industry, television, the fashion industry, acting, modeling, music, graphic design, the emerging tech industry, screenwriting, and more. Everyone I worked with was creative in some capacity. The coffee shop was a means to an end and secondary to their creative career pursuits. It was night and day from the world I had come from in the gas station industry, and a dream come true from my former life on the East Coast where I felt hopeless about my future. I was now alive within that future I once dreamed about. Working at the coffee shop not only changed my life, it opened up my social circle, I met new people, it gave me new perspectives, exposed me to a wide array of careers and cultural backgrounds, and allowed me to explore other sides of myself and who I was on the West Coast. More importantly, the coffee shop was massive and drastic change that became the gateway to eventually finding my purpose. Suddenly, over time, working a variety of shifts at the coffee shop, talking with people from all over the world, I began to see things in life I had never noticed before, or couldn't notice. The coffee shop widened my lens on life. Although I was carving out a new life for myself on the West Coast, changing, adapting, and growing in ways I once thought weren't possible, there was still a part of me that was lost deep down inside. The only way I can describe it now, so many years later, is that it was an empty void deep inside of me. Part of me was unfulfilled. The coffee shop was amazing. I felt so much better about myself. But it wasn't a long-term career with purpose. Although I had moved across the country, changed my life, there was still an empty void inside of me. I was 24, turning 25, my mid-twenties, and I didn't have a greater purpose. I didn't have a long-term career that was fulfilling. Like I said, I was left behind by my friends and peers who were all seemingly building lives and long-term careers. They had direction in life. They had purpose. Meanwhile, I'm on the West Coast still trying to play catch-up, not having the slightest clue what I wanted to do with my life long-term. To be honest, I was just happy to have a life after what I had been through. Day by day, though, that empty void inside of me began to grow and intensify. That empty void only amplified my earlier feelings of being inadequate and less than others. The void of not having a purpose or meaningful career slowly turned into a raging inferno, a deep, burning desire to make something of myself. I couldn't stand feeling inadequate any longer. When you want direction in life and you're searching for a purpose, yet you don't have the answers, you can't see the solutions, it's incredibly frustrating. I looked around at the many people in my life who appeared to have direction and purpose, my co-workers who had clearly defined purpose and direction in creative fields, and thought, why can't I have that type of direction? Why is it so hard for me, yet so easy for them? Walking the downtown streets of Vancouver, all the people on the go, it looked like everyone had a larger purpose and everyone had direction. It felt like I was walking through life as an observer, rather than a participant. Why do they have direction and purpose? And I don't, I often ask myself while out having coffee, people watching and observing. At work each day, I'd meet so many people from around the world who were all seemingly doing amazing things with their lives. The more frustrated I became, and the more I watched people out in the world, my mindset began to change. I thought to myself, if all of these people can find direction and purpose in their lives, be happy and fulfilled in a career, so can I. 
None of this is impossible. I then began to ask myself, what do I need to do specifically in my life to make that happen? But that question quickly transformed into the bigger ultimate question that was plaguing me daily in my mission to make something of myself. What was my purpose in life? That question gave way to even more questions. What was my role in life? What would be my career? What career suited the person I was becoming? What job aligned with who I was as a person? I didn't have the answers, which frustrated me all the more. At the same time, despite beating myself up about not having a purpose, career, and more professional direction in life, I had to go easy on myself. I did understand why it was harder for me. I was forced out of my life path at a young age. While nearly everyone I knew was headed in a straight line toward their future, from A to B to C to university to career to marriage to kids to house and white picket fence, I was forced out of that trajectory. My life was anything but a straight line. Most of my life on the East Coast was dictated by circumstances beyond my control. On the West Coast, however, I finally had control over my future. The pen of my life was in my hand. It was now up to me to draw or write my life in that straight line. I was no longer behind anyone. I had finally caught up to everyone. Although I didn't have the answer to what my true purpose was, or what my career would be, I knew that I had gotten my life back onto an equal playing field by giving myself a fresh start in a new city across the entire country, where I could not only find myself, but also find the purpose that was right for me. I had already given myself direction. I was already engaged in the process of manifesting my future. I was filling that empty void deep down inside of me, whether I knew it or not. Rather than give in to the stress of frustration each day, toiling away in the coffee shop, making myself miserable, I had to trust in my journey and remain open. As long as I remained open, while also taking care of my soul, giving myself and my soul the space to breathe, the answers would come to me. It wasn't about manufacturing a purpose out of desperation to find that very direction. It was about giving myself the necessary space internally for my purpose to find me. It was about making sure I wasn't blocking my daily path with stress and interference. I can honestly say to you right now, each and every time I've acted on desperation and tried to inauthentically manufacture something for my life, it's never worked out. We can all convince ourselves that we need to do something or that something is right for us, when we know deep down it isn't. I mean, there was a time in my life when I thought I was going to be an architect, but ultimately, it wasn't right for me or who I am as a person. Sure, I could have committed to that path, gone to school, spent years studying to become an architect, and gotten into that profession. Sure, I could have manufactured that and made it happen, but ultimately, I would have been unhappy on a daily basis. There was even a time during those early days in Vancouver when I left the coffee shop for a job as a video game tester at video game giant company Electronic Arts. It was an amazing opportunity, and it was also a dream job for a lot of people. I've always been into video games, since the late 70s and early 80s when Pong and Atari gave birth to the video game generation. That was my generation. But when I got the opportunity to test video games for a living, something was wrong. Something was out of alignment. It was during my third year in Vancouver, and I still felt that heavy, empty void from a lack of purpose, not having a clearly defined long-term career. Suddenly, I was given this amazing dream job on the cutting edge of an emerging industry. The problem was, I was still in the process of letting go and finding myself. At the time, the demands of the video game job would require me to be in the office much more than your average 9-to-5 job. Under major deadlines, many video game testers were sleeping at the EA building, waking up and getting back at the job to meet those deadlines. It was a great paying job, a dream job, but I wasn't ready to give up my entire life for a job. I needed more time to breathe. I wasn't ready to sacrifice my soul for a job. Not yet. I was still healing and discovering myself. I also knew deep down that testing video games for a living wasn't my purpose or the direction I wanted. I had to admit that to myself. I had to be honest with myself on a deeper level. Otherwise, I would eventually be unhappy being on the wrong path and caught in the wrong purpose. The takeaway here is that I tried to manufacture this purpose solely because it was such a great opportunity. 
I tried to make it work simply because it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. I had to explore it. I'd be crazy not to. And the fact is, I didn't pass it up. But I wasn't ready to take it on as a career, despite the fact that I was looking for direction and purpose. After a few weeks on the job at Electronic Arts as a video game tester, I left to go back to the coffee shop. People thought I was crazy. Despite the opportunity, it just wasn't right for me. I couldn't fake it for the money. The opportunity came at a time when I still needed to sort myself out. That career was slightly ahead of where I was internally. I simply couldn't manufacture that direction for myself at the time. There were experiences, working for Electronic Arts as a video game tester, that have stayed with me my entire life. When I first got hired, I remember being taken into a room with the other new hires, where our team leaders and supervisors gave us a lesson in the relationship between personal accountability and perception. The lesson was frank, straight to the point, and blunt, like a drill sergeant speaking to new recruits. It was the best professional advice I had ever received and the advice I needed to hear at a time when I was lost. Our supervisor stressed how everything we do in life is a byproduct of perception, how others perceive us positively or negatively, and how we are not only responsible for that perception, but also accountable. If you want others to perceive you positively, it's solely up to you, what you do, the professional standards you set for yourself, and the decisions you make on the job. Perception is everything on the job and in life at large. My time as a video game tester was invaluable in helping me out of my lost state and pushing me toward the discovery of my true purpose. The great thing, however, is that it was an amazingly positive experience. I not only worked on the Triple Play and FIFA video game series of the mid-90s, I also received my first professional credit for working on the Need for Speed video game franchise. Need for Speed Special Edition. I had such a positive experience with my team that my former colleagues voted to have my name on the game. As a result, my name forever appears in the end credits of the special edition of the game. Although I chose to leave that job and walk away from a career in the video game industry, my credit on Need for Speed would never be taken away from me. It was a professional accomplishment that I could leverage for the future. Keep in mind, earlier, I was pumping gas, feeling hopeless about my future. I had gone from pumping gas, to working at a coffee shop, to working for the biggest video game company in the world, with my very first credit. That credit on Need for Speed Special Edition was actually a huge professional leap forward, and a massive positive in my life when I was lost. Still, despite that positivity, my true purpose eluded me. The empty void still existed inside of me on a daily basis. It was gnawing at my soul and wreaking havoc on my self-worth. I so desperately wanted to be like everyone else who was pursuing a fulfilling career, a fulfilling purpose. In fact, that feeling of yearning for my life's purpose got so intense inside of me, like a flame inside a furnace burning bigger and bigger, my furnace of ambition, that I couldn't take overthinking it each day. It was depleting my soul and draining my spirit of energy. I remember laying on my bed one night, saying to myself, that's it. I'm done with searching. I need to find my purpose. I need to free myself of this burden once and for all. It's driving me crazy. And it really was. It was negatively impacting all aspects of my life. I fell asleep that night, late in the middle of the morning around 3 a.m., mentally exhausted and burned out by my burning desire to make something of myself. A burning desire to catch up to my peers, people, my age, who were driven with purpose, happy and fulfilled on their path. That night, I made another deep commitment to myself. No matter what it was going to take, I was going to finally be that guy, the guy I always envisioned, that guy with purpose, that guy that was fulfilled, and the guy I knew I could be going forward. And then it happened. The very next morning when I woke up, I opened my eyes with a familiar clarity I'd felt before. It was a clarity on a level of being, from your soul, and the essence of who you are as a person. It wasn't just an epiphany, but a new state of epiphany at the core of my being. It was as if I was waking up from a coma all over again, like I did years earlier after being hit by a car. I finally had the answer. I shot out of bed in excitement, like a kid on Christmas morning, hopped in the shower, got dressed, and ran to my local coffee shop to wake up even more 
think it over, and unpack my answer. I'm not sure if you're like me when it comes to morning coffee, but I can't do much to start my day unless I have a coffee. It was, and still is, my way of thinking about and unpacking the day ahead. It's still true to this day. I have a coffee beside me right now as I talk to you. Back then, at that moment of epiphany, I wanted to think it through. Did I really find my life's purpose? Did I really have the answer? Did it really come that quickly overnight? How could I be sure? I don't know how the answers came to me overnight, but I woke up that morning in a state of looking back through my past. It was as if I was pressing the rewind button on my life and watching important, pivotal moments of my life play out like a movie. With a newfound level of clarity, I said to myself, all throughout your life, throughout school, elementary school, junior high, high school and university, your best subject was English. You didn't have to work hard for your marks in English. Your grades came naturally to you. Writing essays, book reports, stories, short stories, they all came naturally to you throughout your life. Even in high school, while most of your friends hated English, you took a second English class by studying Canadian literature and Canadian authors. In university, studying sociology and psychology, English was still your best subject. You loved literature, reading books, writing stories, and writing essays. That's the conversation I had with myself as I rewound those pivotal moments of my life that morning. The more I thought about it, the more it all made so much sense. Even in elementary school, grade six, when kids were asked to bring their favorite book to school for a full class of reading, I brought Alex Haley's Roots to school, which was over 700 pages, and tells the story of an 18th century African boy captured as an adolescent, sold into slavery in Africa, and transported to North America. That was in grade six. Also in elementary school, I once wrote Walt Disney a letter thanking him for all the great stories that he'd made for film and television. I didn't mail the letter, but instead, I kept it in my drawer as a kid for years. I also thought back to high school. I was that guy who friends came to when they forgot to write their essay and needed one quickly in order not to fail English class. There were many times I'd written essays in under an hour off the top of my head and gave them to friends to hand in on time. I wasn't proud of doing it, but my friends asked me for help. Sipping on my coffee, outside on the patio in downtown Vancouver, watching the world pass by on the sidewalk that morning, I then began to think of all the books I had read throughout my life, and all the amazing authors I had studied. I also thought of the many people I knew and worked with who were pursuing creative careers. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. All of the authors that I had studied and admired, they had to start somewhere. They likely all started with a passion burning inside them like I have. If they can write for a living and turn it into a career, so can I. Everyone starts somewhere. If my co-workers can pursue creative endeavors and projects for a career, so can I. That's how it starts. That morning, I said to myself, I'm going to be a writer. This is my purpose in life. This is my true career path aligned with who I am and who I've always been. This is your natural talent. Whatever it takes to become successful, learn, and grow, as a writer, I'm committed. Nothing will stop me on my mission to becoming a writer. It happened exactly like I'm telling you now. It was an intuitive grasp on reality from a place of deep knowing inside of me. The answer was inside of me all along. I simply had to be ready to find it, clear out my internal interference, and move forward, rather than continuing to spin in frustration. Now keep in mind, it was the mid-1990s, the internet barely existed, and most people didn't have personal computers in their homes, like today. The mid-90s were a transition period from analog to digital. It was the very end of the analog era and the very beginning of the digital era. Both eras existed at the same time. They overlapped. Some things were done manually, while other things were done with automated digital technology. I didn't have a computer at the time. They were still insanely expensive and less accessible. So I was forced to buy an electric typewriter. I'm proud and thankful to this day that I began my writing career on an old electric typewriter. If you've never seriously used a typewriter before, especially for writing, you had no room for mistakes. Making a mistake on paper meant that you had to throw the entire page away unless you had an electric self-correcting typewriter. Even then, as a writer, a typewriter forced you to be precise with your writing, spelling, grammar, and creative decisions. 
Making a mistake was costly, which usually meant throwing the page away and starting all over again. After finally finding my purpose and making the commitment to myself to become a writer, I knew there was a lot to learn if I wanted to make it a career. Working at the coffee shop now became a means to an end as I pursued my passion. The job now served a greater purpose in my life. To eventually make the shift to writing as a career, to make a living from my writing, I had a lot to learn. Unlike today's online landscape, where everyone can be a writer, writing as a career wasn't easy or accessible. After university, though, having met and learned from various writers, I knew something very important that would make or break my career as a writer. It's one thing to call yourself a writer. That's easy. But it's another thing altogether to earn money as a writer, to make a living from writing, and to call yourself a professional writer. This is what separates writers who do it as a hobby and writers who earn a living professionally in a writing career. Anyone can call themselves a writer, but few people can call themselves a professional writer. That's because it was hard to make money as a writer. Back then, it was the standard in which you were judged as a writer. So, in order to have a successful career as a writer, it was vitally important for me to separate the creative aspect of writing from the business aspect of writing. This is what so many budding writers don't understand early on in the process. To make a living as a writer, you must understand the business of writing, not simply the creative. This is also a dividing line where many people give up on writing as a career. The creative aspects of writing are often fun, exciting, imaginative, invigorating, inspiring, cathartic, and therapeutic. The business aspects of writing aren't so fun. They require a different mindset, and they often conflict with the creative. Things like researching publications that pay, determining which publications accepted unsolicited material, which publications accepted new writers, cold calling editors, asking for writers' guidelines, perfecting your pitch, writing query letters, being able to accept feedback, and also being able to handle numerous rejections and criticisms of your work. The business of writing is vastly different than writing. Fortunately, I was able to find a creativity within the business of writing and the learning process that I loved. That first year, I studied everything I could about writing. I started writing poems and honing my ability to express myself. After all the trauma I had been through in my life on the East Coast, losing my family, losing my identity, getting hit by a car, being in a coma, writing was exactly what I needed at the time to breathe out my trauma. Writing was not only therapeutic, but very cathartic in moving forward. All of my spare time after work at the coffee shop was spent writing and learning. After all that I had been through in my life, after all the setbacks, after working so hard to catch up to others, I was finally getting serious about my purpose in life and my career path. Over time, I began to work on my voice as a writer by expanding into short stories. Keep in mind, this was all on an electric typewriter. The amount of 8.5 by 11 paper I went through was insane. Thank God, typewriter paper wasn't expensive. From short stories, I began to write articles on various topics of interest. I spent the latter half of that year sending out articles for publication to various magazines, newspapers, and local community papers. One way I prepared for publication, to get published as a writer, to get up and running as a writer, was by submitting opinion articles to the opinion section of the newspapers. A few of my opinion pieces were published in the larger local papers. They weren't paid pieces, but they were still published nonetheless. I could then use those on my writing resume. They were great stepping stones to officially getting published and paid as a writer. Luckily that same year, my roommate was just getting into computers. I began to learn and write on a PC386 computer before upgrading that same year to a 486 computer with Windows 95. The internet was just in its infancy, and I was able to make the slow shift away from the typewriter to writing on the computer with programs like Microsoft Word and other word processors. Not only was I writing on a home computer, I was also self-teaching myself everything there was to learn about computers, including DOS and how computers actually worked. I then began to explore the world of writing online in the very early days of the internet. To my surprise, in the mid-90s, there were entire websites, forums, publications, periodicals, and interactive writing communities online where I could learn, grow, and take my writing to new levels. 
Also to my surprise, especially since the internet was so new, barely in its infancy, there were writing-related websites and periodicals that actually paid money upon publication. Like I mentioned earlier, the mid-1990s were a transition period between analog and digital, manual to automation, so to speak. At the time as a writer, using a typewriter, I was manually submitting articles to magazines and newspapers by snail mail, through regular mail at the post office, then waiting weeks to hear back from their editors. The more articles you had out to editors, the better your chances, but it was a long, arduous process. Suddenly, with the emergence of the internet, writing-related websites were accepting articles by digital submission and paying writers for their work in a fraction of the time it took to wait for traditional print publications. I could submit numerous articles online and hear back from editors the very next day. I was just beginning my career as a writer at the exact same time the internet was emerging and changing the writing world. Rather than focus on being a writer via the traditional print medium, I decided to devote all my energy to getting published online. It didn't take long before a writing periodical about the changes within our society wanted to publish one of my articles. The pay wasn't great at all. I think it was around $20 to $30 at the time, but it was my very first article published online. I still have the article printed off somewhere. That one online article began a 20-plus year career as a professional writer and pioneer in one of the most popular industries on the internet, which is the heart of the next chapter in this story. After being published online that first time, I went on to have several other articles published within a few months while still working at the coffee shop. For extra work, I soon began to take shifts at a variety of Starbucks stores in downtown Vancouver. At one store in particular, I met another up-and-coming writer who was also writing online and, coincidentally, was from Nova Scotia where I grew up. He worked there. He was my co-worker. We clicked immediately with common interests, creative goals, and familiar, relatable struggles, both being from the East Coast. It was this meeting that gave me the biggest opportunity of my life and became the foundation for a 20-plus year career in one of the most popular online industries. From this one meeting at the coffee shop, the world opened up in ways I could have never imagined and only once dreamed about, taking me to such places as Los Angeles, New York City, San Francisco, North Carolina, Las Vegas, Hawaii, and more as an early industry pioneer, disruptor, innovator, and writer on many different levels to world premiere red carpets and working with some of the biggest companies and names in the world. Stay tuned for the next episode of Starting Overdrive Turning Points called The Biggest Opportunity of My Life, in which I tell the story of how my professional writing world opened up with a direct main line to Hollywood, which launched my career as an early pioneer and innovator in online journalism, editing, publishing, marketing, and more. As a result of this one opportunity, I became one of a handful of writers that created the online entertainment industry and the template for the industry you see today. Thanks for listening to the Starting Over Drive podcast. Join us next time for another real story of starting over. In the meantime, make sure to follow us on Spotify, YouTube, Amazon, Stitcher, and all major podcasting platforms. Head to the Starting Overdrive Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our channels, help us grow, and feel free to share your story of starting over. Or even let us know if you relate to any of the issues touched upon in our interviews. You can also find us at the Starting Overdrive podcast at the official site, www.startingoverdrive.com. Thank you.